confirm that you saw me advance the slide. Do you see slides yes. that this is outlined? Yeah. Great. So I'm going to start off with a little bit of COVID background. Um, so the the virus that causes COVID um, can cause symptoms like fever, cough, shortness of breath, loss of taste and smell, headache and sore throat. But it's important to note that some people have no symptoms at all and people without symptoms can spread the virus. More black and Latino people have been sick, hospitalized and died from COVID-19 than any other racial and ethnic group. These differences in health outcomes are due to long-term structural racism, including policies and discriminatory practices that prevent communities of color from accessing vital resources and opportunities. And this disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on New Yorkers of color highlights how these inequities negatively influence health outcomes. Equity is central to the, the Department of Health's COVID-19 response and vaccine program, and we know that we must earn trust, build confidence, and deliver community-focused information and programming. We commit to taking actions to address health and social inequities that have been amplified during this pandemic. To date, over 30 million doses of COVID vaccine have been administered to people throughout the United States and in New York City, specifically over one and a half million doses have been administered. This is really remarkable. It's, it's a huge achievement, but we know that we still have a long way to go. The figure on the left shows the number of daily cases of COVID in New York City. And you can show, uh, you can see the, the first wave that we experienced, um, and you can see that now we're in the second wave, and the second wave has actually been worse than the first wave in New York City. The map on the right shows the percent of people who test positive for COVID with the darker colors of red representing neighborhoods that have been harder hit than others. So you know, the map really shows that COVID has occurred throughout New York City, but certain, certain areas have been harder hit than others. And this is just a reminder of the importance for everybody to continue to take preventive actions to avoid the spread of COVID, including staying home if you're sick, distancing by six feet, wearing face coverings, and keeping your hands clean. So now for some brief background about what vaccines are. Well, vaccines help people to develop immunity or protection from a disease so that their body can defend against the disease if exposed to it. And there are many different types of vaccines out there, not just for COVID, of course, um, and vaccines work by preventing people from either getting symptoms and complications from a disease or, and or by preventing people from getting the disease in the first place. Vaccines save lives. They help protect people who get the vaccine, and sometimes they also protect the people around them and possibly entire communities. Key messages about the vaccines that I want to make sure um, you take away from this presentation, and I'll talk more about the first one in detail, but COVID vaccines are safe and effective. The vaccines are available to New Yorkers at no cost. They're available to people of all immigration statuses and vaccination is not a public benefit under the public charge rule. And when people are vaccinated, their privacy will be protected. Many people ask how the vaccines were developed so quickly and people understandably express concern that um, whether safety could have been compromised by developing the vaccine so, so quickly. And that's not the case, um, but I'm going to walk you through how, how the vaccines were developed so quickly. And so for background, there are four phases of vaccine clinical trials, and each phase studies whether the vaccine works and is safe. In phase one trials, typically they are small and they include fewer than 100 people. Phase two clinical trials include several hundred people. And phase three trials are very large. They include thousands of people, and usually half of the people get vaccine and the other half receive no vaccine or, or placebo. And um, usually, ideally in, in phase three trials, the demographics of the people who are vaccinated should be similar to the demographics of the people intended to receive the vaccine 
once it's available for the general population. For, FD, for vaccines, the FDA monitors vaccine development from the beginning to the end. They analyze clinical trial data to decide whether to allow the vaccine to be used, and they continue to monitor vaccine safety data even after vaccine approval. We get lots of questions about emergency use authorizations and um, or EUAs, people wanting to know what they are. So in an emergency like COVID-19, the FDA may allow vaccines to be used before they are officially licensed by issuing an emergency use authorization or an EUA so that we can use them right away. No shortcuts in the testing of the vaccines are allowed. All vaccines issued an EUA must go through the same clinical trials as all other vaccines. An EUA can be issued only if the evidence strongly suggests that the benefits outweigh any risks to patients. Several federal agencies and external organizations monitor vaccine safety during trials and as part of ongoing evaluations after vaccines are approved. And these safety monitoring systems have been in place for, for many years, and they are very strong, robust safety monitoring systems. And in addition to all the existing systems that have been in place for a long, long time, uh, additional safety monitoring systems have been added just for COVID vaccine. Now we'll talk specifically about the COVID vaccines. So how were the vaccines developed so quickly? Scientists built on many years of research from other vaccines, including research on vaccines for other coronaviruses. The federal government also provided special funding to allow for the development, testing, and production of vaccines to happen at the same time. And that's not usually how things work. So normally for vaccines, manufacturers have to go through, the, they, they go through the entire clinical trial process and if and only if the vaccine is approved for use, at that point, they will first begin developing the vaccines. And that's because it takes a long time to develop the vaccines and it's incredibly expensive. So normally a company would never um, be able to spend the money to make vaccines that might not ever be approved for use. But during this pandemic, um, billions of dollars were given to the company so that they can could develop the vaccines in advance and. Um, that they would be ready to distribute them immediately if an EUA was issued. Um, the other way that things were sped up is that the federal government, health departments, and healthcare providers were working for months before vaccines were even approved, planned for storage, distribution, supplies, and other logistics. Usually those things would wait until after a vaccine is, uh, was approved. To date in the United States, two vaccines have been authorized by the FDA for use. And those include Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccines. Other vaccines are in various stages of testing. How do these mRNA vaccines work? Well, COVID messenger RNA or mRNA vaccines contain genetic material from the COVID virus, but they do not contain the actual virus and they Therefore, they cannot cause COVID infection. And while mRNA vaccines are new, it's a new type of vaccine, it's actually been studied for over 30 years for other, other types of diseases. So we were not starting from scratch, which enabled us to move more quickly <clears throat> in the vaccine development process. And this is how they work. The mRNA enters the body with instructions on how to make a protein that is part of the virus that causes COVID-19. The proteins produced then trigger the body to make antibodies and other defenses. The mRNA is then broken down and destroyed by the body. It does not stay in the body, um, so it leaves quickly. And um, the mRNA never enters the nucleus of, the, of a person's cell, and therefore the mRNA does not and cannot interact with a person's own DNA. Then later, if a person is exposed to the virus that causes COVID-19, the body can recognize it and um, produce antibodies to fight it. We get a lot of questions about which vaccine people should get, the Pfizer or Moderna, and um, the answer is that it really doesn't matter. Whichever is available to you is the right vaccine to get. 
Um, the two vaccines are much more similar than they are different. Both were found to be safe and incredibly effective across all gender, age, race, and ethnic groups. Both vaccines prevented sickness or severe COVID in over 94% of study volunteers. And this is pretty incredible. Um, just for reference, the FDA only requires to vaccines to be 50% effective in order to be approved. Um, and so this, this very high effectiveness is actually higher than we see for m most other vaccines. Um, both vaccines require two doses and both vaccines can cause the same mild to moderate side effects. For both vaccines, the phase three clinical trials were huge. They included over 30,000 people in the United States. And the both studies included good representation from people of varied different age groups and across different race and ethnic groups. The Pfizer vaccine was approved for use in people aged 16 years and older and Moderna for people aged 18 years and older. So we know a lot about the vaccines at this point, over 30 million doses being administered throughout the United States um, and it's now been in use for several months. Um, However, there are still things that we don't know. We don't know how long protection from the vaccine will last or whether additional doses will be needed in the future. So um, the clinical trial data included data from people who had um, over a period of two months after they received their second dose. And we know that vaccine protection lasts at least for a few months, um, but we don't yet know if um, this will be more like the flu vaccine where people need to be revaccinated each year, um, or maybe if we're lucky, vaccine protection will be lifelong. We also don't yet know whether the vaccine is safe and effective for children, and that's because the clinical trials that were completed were only done in people aged 16 years and older. Um, but fortunately, trials have started in children, and hopefully in the future there will be a vaccine um, for the the younger age groups. We know that the vaccines work incredibly well at preventing people from getting sick from COVID and preventing hospitalizations and death. This is incredibly important. Um, what, we, what we also don't know though is um, whether the vaccine also prevents infection in people with no symptoms, so milder infection with no symptoms, um, and, and therefore we don't know yet um, how well the vaccine will prevent spreading the virus to other people. So we still have a lot to learn. The way that vaccine is distributed um, is based on different eligible groups. And we in New York City followed the requirements from New York State, which is based on guidance from CDC, which prioritizes people who are at increased risk for getting COVID-19 or who are at increased risk of severe illness. And currently eligible groups include healthcare workers, people aged 65 years and older, residents and staff in nursing homes, homeless shelters, and certain other group living facilities, certain frontline essential workers, and people with certain underlying medical conditions. Other groups to be prioritized will probably include additional essential workers in the future, um, but Phase distribution will take time. We simply do not have enough vaccine available to vaccinate everybody who needs it at this point. And we don't expect enough vaccine to be widely available until around mid 2021. Because the list of eligible groups is continually changing, the best thing to do is to go to the nyc.gov website to see, um, see if, if um, the, who is currently eligible. The health department has been ensuring equitable access to COVID vaccines through opening vaccine sites in communities most impacted by the pandemic, by making sure that communities receive clear and up-to-date information, partnering with community-based organizations, um, speaking openly about what we do and do not know, and monitoring data and community feedback to identify needs and gaps in access. There's strong evidence that vaccines are safe and effective. They protect you from COVID-19, which can have serious health consequences. And 
Although people think of COVID as um, something very serious in the elderly, people of all ages have been hospitalized and died from, from, from this virus. Also, some people continue to have health problems even after they're no longer sick. The vaccines may also help protect people around you and help helps move us closer to ending the public health emergency and getting New York City back on its feet. At this point in time, children less than 16 years of age cannot be vaccinated until clinical trials have been done in this group. Um, people with all other medical conditions or conditions can be vaccinated. Um, for some groups like people who are pregnant or who are breastfeeding, they can choose to be vaccinated, um, but there is limited information about safe, the safety and effectiveness of the vaccines in, in pregnant people because pregnant uh, women were not included in the clinical trials. Um, that being said, based on how the vaccines work, um, it is thought to be safe and effective. Um, but if someone um, has questions, um, they, we recommend that they speak with their healthcare provider. Um, but vaccine is, is important for pregnant people because we know that people who are pregnant can have more serious COVID infection. There are many different options for places to get vaccinated. Um, depending on where you work, you might be able to get it through work or the city has sites throughout the boroughs. There are also healthcare facilities and some pharmacies who are vaccinating. The pharmacies are um, at this point prioritizing people age 65 years and older. But the best thing to do is go to nyc.gov to find a vaccine site near you. Make an appointment first, make sure that you're eligible by going to the nyc.gov website, and then you can schedule an appointment at um, the nyc.gov website online or by calling. When you make an appointment, you will need to complete an NYC vaccine form. And when you go to get vaccinated, bring proof of eligibility and um, make sure you get an, make an appointment for your second dose. This is just a screenshot to show you what it looks like when you uh, go online to find a vaccine site. And make sure you get your second dose. And that's because the, the first dose does offer some protection but optimal protection occurs after you receive your second dose. Um, also, we don't know how long protection after the first dose lasts. So it is very important to get um, the second dose and protection typically occurs one to two weeks after uh, you get the second dose. The second dose should be of the same vaccine type as your first dose. So for example, if the first dose was Pfizer, the second dose should be Pfizer. <clears throat> The timing for when you should receive the second dose depends on whether you got Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. So the Pfizer vaccine should be given at 21 to 42 days after the first shot and Moderna 28 to 42 days after the first shot. When you get vaccinated, you'll get a vaccination card and you should bring the card with you when you go for your second shot. Most people do report some side effects from the vaccines, which are usually normal signs that your body is building protection. And this is a good thing. Um, common side effects include soreness or swelling on the arm where you got the shot, headache, body aches, tiredness, and fever. Side effects are usually mild to moderate, and they usually start within the first three days after getting the shot. And the side effects usually last for about one to two days after they begin. And the symptoms are typically more common after you get your second shot. Symptoms are also less common in older adults. Again, side effects are expected and, and normal reactions to the vaccine. But if you have any side effects that concern you or that don't go away after a few days, or if the redness or soreness where you got the shot increases or worsens after 24 hours, call your healthcare provider. Talk to your healthcare provider about taking something like Tylenol or Advil to relieve pain or discomfort if you develop it, but it is not recommended to take this medicine before getting vaccinated. Also, um, it's important to get your second shot, even if you have mild to moderate side effects after the first shot, unless your provider tells you not to. Allergic reactions have occurred following these vaccines, but they are not common. Talk to your healthcare provider before getting vaccinated if you have ever had an allergic reaction to a vaccine or injectable medicine, or if you are allergic to any ingredient in a COVID vaccine. 
Other types of allergies to things like to food, pet, dust, pollen, latex, eggs, those are not contraindications to get vaccinated. With any of those allergies, you can still get vaccinated. I also want to highlight the difference between side effects, which are expected after vaccination, and allergic reactions. Allergic reactions usually start within minutes to an hour of getting the shot and may include things like difficulty breathing, swelling of your face and throat, a fast heartbeat, a bad rash all over your body, dizziness, and weakness. If you think you're having a severe allergic reaction, call 911 or go to the nearest hospital. After vaccination, you should still continue to stay home if you're sick, distance, wear a face covering, and wash your hands often. And this is because, like all vaccines, the COVID vaccines are not 100% effective, although they are very, very effective at preventing you from getting very sick from COVID and preventing you from being hospitalized or dying from COVID. However, we still need to learn more about how long protection from the vaccine lasts and the impact of vaccine on um, disease transmission or spreading it from person to person. And the city will update guidance if and when we can ease prevention measures. Finally, I want to end by reminding everyone to take care of your mental health. This is an incredibly stressful time for everybody uh, during this pandemic. So uh, the New York, so the, the city offers free 24 seven counseling, um, which you can access by phone. The number is listed here or by texting or chatting online. Uh, thank you and um, happy to take any questions or if we'll go to the next speakers. Um, Thank you, Dr. Rosen. Um, we can actually introduce um, our next speakers. So this particular session is specifically for home care workers. So I'm excited that we have two home care workers here with us today, Minerva and Ramona, to kind of talk about their experience uh, getting vaccinated and, and share that information with you all. Um, so if um, either Minerva or Ramona wants to unmute and talk to the group here about what it was like um, deciding to get vaccinated and how the vaccine was as a home care worker. Um, maybe let's start with Minerva. Yes, hi, good afternoon. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> oh, hi, how you doing? Okay, my name is Minerva Acevedo. I've been in cooperative home care for 17 years. And I decided, I put my state of mind from the beginning to get the vaccine because I they started with the elderly people. And I said, why, if I'm healthy, I'm gonna go for it. And like I said, it's just for my protection and for my family that I did it. Thank you, Minerva. And then Ramona, did you want to unmute and talk about your experience? Yes, hi, good afternoon. My name is Ramona. So I can't, I can't lie. You know, I remember that when everybody else had to be in and if I want to take um, the vaccine, I always said no because I was scared about that. But I remember that when they, one of the nurses asked me, um, we were going to do the vaccine, and I said, I just take no more than 10 seconds to think about it's not only about me. So it's not like um I said, you know what? I love me, but I cannot say that I love me if I don't love others. It's not only about me, it's about my kids, it's about my family, it's about my co-workers, it's about all each other third people that is around me every day, and I wanna be safe for them too. So, and I think that this is the, one of the more important benefits is that I feel safe for them and for me, for myself. And the experience was good. I remember that I was there. I was nervous. I don't like the vaccination. It's not only the COVID, it's every, everything. And I was like, I remember that the doctor said, you're ready? And I said, I'm never, <laughs> I'm never ready for that. But um, when she finished, that she was a very good doctor, she said, I'm done. And I said, oh, really? I feel nothing. <laughs> so, but now I feel that was the best decision that I take, that I took because um, I feel 
faith. And I know that if I feel faith is it is because I can think older. All those people that is um, important for me. Um, that's it. Thank you, Ramona. Um, might have been a little hard to hear, but I was able to hear um, most of what you said. Thank you so much. Um, Minerva, I don't think you had a chance to talk about what the experience was like. Like Ramona, did you have anything else to add? My experience, um, I just had um, for the first dose, I had a little bit of pain in the area. And with the second dose, I just felt a little bit tired. But other than that, I didn't get nothing else. Everything was fine. And now I feel safe to hug my, my kids again and my family. Thank you both for sharing. Um, if any questions come up uh, from the Q&A chat uh, for you all, uh, we'll let you know if there's any specific questions for you or um, if Dr. Rosen will answer the questions. Um, Ali, are you able to see any questions in the chat? Yeah, hi, thank you, Dr. Rosen, and to our uh, guest speakers today for sharing your experiences. We I don't see any in the Q&A. For those who are with us, if you do have questions, please address them to the Q&A box so that we can uh, ask our panelists. Um, I had one question come through privately, uh, and I'm not sure, Dr. Rosen, if you can address this yet, about uh, what preparations are being made to vaccinate homebound patients. Hi, thanks for that question. I, I know that the agency is um, working on that very important issue. The, the big challenge right now is that the two vaccines that are approved, the two mRNA vaccines, are very fragile. Um, so you have to be very careful with transporting them. It's not like the flu vaccine where you can go sort of door to door with um, these vaccines because um, again, they are very fragile, um, which makes it very hard to transport them. And the other issue is um, their storage requirements also make it very challenging to transport them. Um, one of them, one of the vaccines needs to be stored at a very, very cold freezer that's typically only available. It's a deep freezer, usually only available at hospitals. The other also needs to be um, stored at frozen temperatures. And so, um, the, the good news is that um, one of the vaccines that's under development, the J and Johnson and Johnson vaccine, um, they they submitted a request for emergency use authorization. We don't know yet whether it will be approved, but um, if it is approved, the storage requirements are are very different for that vaccine, and it, the vaccine is not as fragile. So. Um, if that vaccine is approved, we know at least that that vaccine would be more amenable to transporting place to place um, for homebound individuals. But th the city is also um, has been working on um, services for homebound people to um, to get them transportation to vaccination sites. And I don't know, Al Allison, if you have any further information on that that could be shared. I don't think that's something we'll have to find uh, offline and, and we can either follow up with attendees of this webinar via email or make that available uh, on our web page. I know that there are some who have asked how they can find this information in the presentation uh, and we do want to let people know that it is available on our vaccine web page. I will post that link uh, in the Q&A area of the WebEx so that people can have that available to them as well. We did have a few more questions come in in the meantime. Um, let's see. For oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Speakers. I, I'm okay. sorry, Allison. Um, I, I did find. I, I just went to our website, um, and um, the website does say if you um, um, other transportation options for people um, include if you have Accessoride or Medicaid provided transportation, then people should schedule rides as they normally would. Um, but if they are homebound and 65 or older, they can schedule free ambulance transportation to your vaccination site. Um, for those people who do not use Accessoride or Medicaid provided transportation, 
they can also schedule a free ride to the vaccination site. Um, so if they schedule for, for such people, if they um, make an appointment at one of the New York City run sites, um, when their appointment confirmation will include more information on how to secure transport. Wonderful, thank you very much for finding out so quickly. Sure. Um, we had a question for our uh, guest speakers. Can you please speak a little bit more about your experience getting an appointment and how was your experience at the site when you went to receive the appointment? Uh, to, went to your appointment to receive the vaccine. So either Minerva or Ramona, if you uh, are able to. Um, my experience doing my appointment, like it was in the beginning when it was available for us, it was easy. And I went right next to my um to my house, like five minute walk. And going in there, um, they just checked me, made they gave me a an ID number and I showed them my 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 appointment and I just went in and it was quick and easy. And the nurse was like Ramona said, I didn't even notice when she put the first shot. And the second was the the second I had to wait a little bit long in line, but it was in and real quick. It was easy scheduling the appointment though. Great, thank you. I'm glad to hear that it was easy for you. Um, and well, Alice, let's see. Allison, this is Bindi. I was just wondering if I could just say a few words about appointments. Thank you, go ahead. Yeah, sure. So thanks everyone for being here. I'm Bindi Crouch, also um, from the health department. Um, I work with Allison, Dr. Rosen and Erica. And just, I just wanted to say a few words because we are working on um, various ways to assist you all in getting appointments to be vaccinated. Um, so um, for, for any of you who are home care or home health workers that are associated with a, with a union, you should please reach out to your union as the unions are um, making waiting lists, um, putting together waiting lists for individuals who want to be vaccinated. And then we're working with the city um, to reserve um, blocks of appointments. Um, so the unions will be are working to um, put uh, slot people into these um, reserved appointments. Um, in addition, if you are um, do not work within a union, then you can talk to agency um, about planning for um, vaccination appointments also. And we are doing work with the associations and the agencies um, to work out how we can add people um, who are on waiting lists um, to reserved appointments. In addition, so right now we have a site in the Bronx um, that is open um, and reserving appointments and we've just adding we're just adding this week locations in queens as well as brooklyn in addition we will be adding in um starting with one in brooklyn and then adding another site in queens um using one of the uh occupational health providers that home care workers um, many of you will have worked um, work with in the past. And so um, you'll be getting information from your agencies about the ability to make an appointment for a vaccine with one of these providers. And th that provider will be um, exclusively providing vaccinations um, at these sites for home care and home health workers. So please reach out to your agency. And if you're part of a union, also reach out to your union. Wonderful. Thank you for the comprehensive answer, Dr. Crouch. Uh, we have a few more questions that uh, likely are maybe something uh, Dr. Crouch or Dr. Rosen could answer for us. Um, participants are curious, how long can a person show a positive result for a PCR test? Uh, and what does that mean for them in terms of uh, getting the vaccine? Sure. So, um, People who um, people do not need to get PCR testing before getting the vaccine. Um, the vaccine is recommended regardless of whether or not you've had infection in the past. And that's because um, people 
can still get reinfected. So the vaccine would help prevent reinfection. Um, people who know that they are currently infected um, with the virus because they have symptoms and they were tested, or um, if someone was um, tested even though they had no symptoms but came back positive and it's still within their contagious period, um, which is considered through 10 days after the first positive test result, those people should wait to get vaccinated and that until they feel better and until their isolation period is over. And that's because we don't want people who are contagious to go into a vaccination site and expose other people. Um, that being said, to your more specific question about how long people can remain PCR positive, um, people can remain PCR positive beyond the period when they are still contagious. And that's because the test detects virus even when the virus is dead and the dead virus can hang, hang around for a while. Um, so the, the period that people are considered contagious is through 10 days after the first PCR positive test. Um, beyond that period, people don't need to remain home um, and it is okay to go ahead and go get your vaccine. Great, thank you, Dr. Rosen. And just one more question. I know you had spoken a little bit during the presentation about uh, pregnant persons receiving the vaccine, but we had another question about persons with autoimmune disease or allergies or other medical conditions in that arena. Um, and if that, those are any contraindications or reasons why they should not get the vaccine. Um, there are no medical conditions that are contraindications to getting the vaccine. So people with any medical condition can get the vaccine. Um, that being said, the and, and, and in fact, many medical conditions put people at very high risk for serious COVID infection. So with, with many medical conditions, it's even more important that you get the vaccine to protect yourself. Um, and people with most medical conditions were included in the clinical trials to know that the vaccine is safe and works well in these groups. Um, there are some exceptions. Uh, as I mentioned, pregnant women were not generally included in the clinical trials, so there's limited information. Um, same, the same goes with people who are immunocompromised. They were not included in the clinical trials, so people with weakened immune systems, so we're talking about people who um, maybe have are on chemotherapy for cancer, for example, or people with AIDS. Um, those are examples of people who may have weakened immune systems. Um, they can still get the vaccine, um, but since they were not included in the clinical trials, we don't yet know, um, we don't have data to confirm that the vaccine will work, and um, we don't have data on safety in these groups. That being said, um, you know, the vaccines are expected to probably potentially be safe in, in this in in this group. It's the vaccines are not live virus vaccines. And so um you know we don't worry about any sort of it doesn't they don't include the virus and um, so we don't have to worry about any sort of virus replicating um in people with weakened immune systems. Um the, the bigger question is really will the vaccines work as well in someone whose immune system is not as strong. Um, and similarly there's a lack of information on how well the vaccine will work and safety in people with autoimmune conditions. Um, again, we, we believe that the vaccines would be safe, uh, should be safe in these groups um, and people can choose to get vaccinated. But if someone has, you know, one of these conditions, they, you know, they can certainly speak with their medical provider to help them make a decision. Uh, in terms of people with allergies, allergies, uh, a history of allergic reactions is the only time where there may be a contraindication to vaccination. Um, so people who cannot get the vaccine are people who had a serious or immediate allergic reaction to the first dose of COVID vaccine. So for example, if someone had anaphylaxis and had to go to the emergency room after the first dose, um, they should not get the second dose. Um, and people who have had serious allergic reactions to other vaccines or injectable medicines should speak with their provider before getting the vaccine. But any other allergy, like to things like eggs or medicine that you take by mouth or food or um, environmental allergens, um, people can still get the vaccine. Those are not contraindications to vaccination. 
Wonderful, thank you very much. Those are all the questions that I'm seeing in our Q&A box. Again, if any of our participants who are still with us have any questions, please feel free to address those to the box. Um, and otherwise we can end a bit early today if any, unless any of our panelists have any additional information they would like to add now at the end of the webinar. It looks like that might be it for us. We wanna uh, thank everybody so much for joining us today. Um, and we did share that link to our vaccine webpage, which does also include uh, handouts that you might be able to distribute to uh, employees. Uh, if you have others who or colleagues that you work with who have more questions about vaccination. And we thank you for uh, browsing that page because most of the information that you heard today in the presentation from Dr. Rosen can be found there. So uh, seeing no other questions, we'll close the event and thank you again for joining us. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.